Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 45. Are you interested in processing images in Python? Do you need to load and modify images for your Flask or Django website or CMS? Then most likely you will be working with Pillow, the friendly fork of PIL, the Python Imaging Library. This week on the show, we have Mike Driscoll, who's writing a new book about image processing in Python. We dive deep into the types of processing Pillow provides. Mike talks about creating Python GUI applications to take advantage of all the library has to offer. We also talk about his Pi Dev of the Week series and his Python interviews book. This episode is brought to you by Scout APM. Scout APM is application performance monitoring designed to help developers quickly find and fix performance issues without dealing with the headache or overhead of enterprise platform feature bloat. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hi, Mike. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me again. So when we last talked, you were doing a lot of work getting the Python 101 book sort of into revision two. Um, how's that going? And or has it already come out? Um, yeah, it, it actually got finished up over the summer and I released it in August. How's the reactions been? Oh, pretty positive. I've gotten some really good reviews on Amazon. And I think I had one one guy who said that some, somebody I've never heard of on YouTube covers everything in my book. So why would you buy it? But, <laughs> that's interesting you know most people are super positive <laughs> like he takes them chapter by chapter or something like that or that's weird or it's just the topic i don't know i've never heard okay. of this guy. <laughs> I, th- I think i can't believe somebody on youtube has covered every single topic in python 101 because i yeah this book is massive with like over 500 pages so yeah and and we talked all about all of the additional stuff that you have in there for uh, getting like you know projects and stuff, kind of getting people a taste of what to do with it once they once they get going. All that stuff with PDFs and 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 so forth, kind of getting going. So that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's very different because it covers the basic syntax in like the first 10, 20 chapters, and then the rest are like, hey, here's how you can use Python with X- Microsoft Excel. Here's how to create a PDF. Here's how to create a a GUI with WX Python stuff like that. I, I, I just can't imagine someone being that wide ranging on YouTube right now. Although I know there are some that specialize in like machine learning. Yeah, it's pretty rare. <laughs> Partly why I wanted you to come on the show is you are working on another book project. And this one is about the Pillow library. Do you want to talk about what's going on there? Oh, sure. So Pillow is uh, the friendly fork of the Python imaging library, which came out many, many years ago. I think Pillow itself is over 10 years old. And basically, it lets you edit photos with Python. You can, it works with Python 2 and 3, although I don't know why you'd still be on Python 2, but... Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I was stuck on it until March of last year, but some people get stuck on it, and it's really cool that it has always worked for so long. But, you know, you can do all kinds of different things with Pillow and images. Yeah, we'll probably dive into that more like some of your other books you're doing this as uh, initially to kind of get things going as a kickstarter yes i I am using kickstarter for this particular project as well so what are some of the reasons that you use kickstarter so i use kickstarter more as a way to gauge interest in a book not necessarily to get funds but the funds definitely help sure i know you'd mentioned something about the getting the isbn numbers and kind of securing all those for the different formats that you put out Yes, if if I apply ASBN numbers for everything, that can be kind of expensive. Although a lot of like, like Amazon will provide a free one now. Oh, nice! If you don't mind them having their name attached to your book, you know. Uh, okay. If I if I just <laughs> just want myself attached to it, then I have to pay for my own ISBN. Okay. Anyway, when did you start the Kickstarter, and how long does it last till? 
I started it on January 4th, and it lasts for 30 days. Okay, so to the top of February here. Okay. I think February 4th, February 3rd, somewhere in there. Okay. It looked like you already met your goal, which is great. So it looks like you have a good interest uh, started. Yes, yeah. The, the book has gotten positive feedback already. This one I started out by giving it to a few people that I trust to do beta reading. And I also have two technical reviewers who are giving me feedback on it and help me keep the book focused and uh, well-written. Great. So as you're laying out the chapters, what are the types of things that you're going to dive into in the book? I have your sort of sneak preview <laughs> version of the book. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, And it had the first sort of three chapters laid out. So like it starts out with Pillow Basics and then gets into colors and then image data, which I want to dive into a little bit more. What can we expect for the for the other parts? Yeah, so the the rest of the book is going to cover like the internals of the pillow, like what what do you what you can do with it beyond that. So you know, getting XF data is great, but pillow comes with an image filter module you can use to apply filters to your images. It allows you to crop, rotate, and resize images. Image enhance is kind of like image filters. It does some similar things and some different things. Hmm. Like uh, Image Enhance can do brightness and contrast, but it also does some blurring that the image filters do as well. Okay. Then I look at combining images. So you can combine images in different ways by concatenating images, or you can blend them together using a mask or using a compositing function that kind of is... I, it's kind of hard to describe the difference between the two, but one like uses the alpha channel more than the other. And then later on in the book, I'm going to talk about drawing with Pillow. So you can draw shapes on your images Kind of like how people like to take uh, Instagram and like draw funny shapes on their photos and whatnot. I would think that might be useful in a way to do something like if you have a, I do a lot of teaching and explaining. And so a common thing would be to do like a screen shot mm -hmm. and then like have like arrows <laughs> pointing at things or circle things or put squares around things. Yeah. Would that be something that you could do there? Yeah, you could do that too with, with it. Yeah. Oh, cool. There's also like two specialized modules that aren't talked about very much, in my opinion, when it comes to Pillow. One is Image Chops and one is Image Ops. So personally, I use Image Chops at my job to do an image comparison test testing. And Image Ops, I've actually not used very much at all. So I'm really interested to see what all I can do with that particular module. So is that spelled Chops, like C-H-O-P-S? Yeah, it is. Okay. And... The idea behind it is a bit of comparison, like looking at differences between images. Is that the main idea? I mean, that's what I use it for. I think it has other operations. It, the chops is short for channel operations. Okay. So, you know, I haven't looked at this one super close. It looks like it has some of the same things that the image object itself does. So image object lets you paste and blend. It looks like ch image chops also has a blend function. So I don't really know does it use the same thing underneath that the image object does? I haven't dived into their code to see how these things work exactly yet. So when I think of channels, I think of the color channels, um, potentially like red, green, blue levels. Is that kind of what they're talking about there? Or is it some other form of channels? Uh, according to the documentation, it's an arithmetical image operation called channel operations. Okay. Used for special effects, image compositions, algorithmic painting, and more. That sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know how deep I'll get into this because some of it might even be over my head. But you know, I'm going to cover the parts that may, that I've used personally, and anything that I think my my readers will find helpful to use with that module. To go back to how you're using it, what's your your use in day to day? Yeah, so at my workplace, I'm a automated test engineer. And so I test this GUI that's written in C++ using Python. And one of the things that we do is I need to take a screenshot of some, th some state on the app. And then I reload the app and see did the state stay. And when you use image chops, I think it's the diff, the diff function in it. It will take the two images. Yeah, difference is what it is. I'll take the two images and it'll return a pixel by pixel difference as an image object that I didn't save off. And if that image object is completely black with no no white in it, then the images are exactly the same. If there's any white in it, it'll be in that little black image that it returned. And you can actually see what the difference is most of the time. 
and you'll know, oh, my, you know, X, Y, or Z is off by a couple of pixels and something isn't, isn't translating correctly. You know, did the map transfer from one, one app to the other app? Because we also support running these apps in parallel in, in multiple vehicles. And so they need to all update the same way and draw the same, draw the map the same way. That's cool. So this has a, been a reliable way for you to confirm those uh, differences in your testing? Yeah, it's worked really well for the vast majority of cases. I've had a couple of weird times where I've had to enhance the the RGB values so that they kind of bl- kind of blow them out so that they can see the differences better. Yeah. Or actually, so it'll capture so I can see the differences better because <laughs> the computer can see them. <laughs> yeah, it still looks black to me, and it's like there's a difference here, and I'm like, I don't see any difference. What are you talking about? So before I make the comparison, I blow it out just to make sure that I can see what the difference is, so I know what's wrong. Yeah, kind of like a enhance it for human <laughs> yeah. uh, vision, if you will. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. And then. The other one you haven't worked with as much, the one called Ops, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And what's that one do? So it is uh, ready-made for image processing operations, and it has some interesting things in it, like auto contrast. It can do colorizing of grayscale images. Okay. Deform an image, stuff like that. I I think of the, as a person who's played in Photoshop for, I don't know, a couple decades, just kind of messing around in it, there's always this sort of, I don't want to say generic, but there's because I've used it so long, it feels generic because there's like this list of uh, sort of standard filters that are in there, and they they would be mm-hmm. uh, like emboss and <laughs> and and things like that. That maybe the algorithm or the arithmetic involved has become somewhat standardized in the image processing world that they could include it in this library. Pretty, you know, as a, a fairly standard uh, inclusion. Does that feel the same way to you? I would think so. So there actually is an emboss filter in the image filter module. Yeah. And it it has a few other ones like blur, detail, edge enhance, and smoothing and sharpening filters. So it has those kind of filters, but you're not going to have like the really cool filters like you do with HDR or... Or like replace the background and fancy stuff like that. Yeah, stuff like that it's not going to have. So when you go into something like, let's say, sharpening, it still provides a a couple of parameters that you can adjust inside of that? Yeah, and it's, so the way that the filters work is it has a, a enhancement factor okay. between zero and pretty much infinity. But you know, logically, if you look at it, it's like zero to like five or 10. And it, it's a float. Okay. So you can, it has a fairly decent amount of scalability of what you can do. But yeah. Since it's not like interactive, it's not like a GUI. You can't always see what it's doing until you like reopen the the output again, or or you call show and it'll show it to you. But then you have to open up the original, so you have it side by side. Scout APM is application performance monitoring designed to help developers quickly find and fix performance issues without dealing with the headache or overhead of enterprise platform feature bloat. With a developer centric UI and tracing logic that ties bottlenecks to source code. Scout pinpoints and resolves performance abnormalities like N plus one queries, memory bloat, and more. So you can spend less time debugging and more time building a great product. And with Scout's real-time alerting and weekly digest emails, you can rest easy knowing Scout's on watch to help you resolve performance issues before your customers ever see them. Better yet, at only $39 a month, Scout provides the insights you need in less than four minutes. Start your 14-day trial today, and as an added bonus for real Python listeners, Scout APM will donate five dollars to the open source project of your choice when you deploy. Go to scoutapm.com/realpython. So, one of the things that you're looking at doing inside of the book is taking people not only through all these different parts of Pillow and talking about you know like. In simply opening images and saving images and mm-hmm. things like that, which you should probably talk about what image formats it works with. <laughs> but your goal is to get them to a point of building kind of an application, a simple GUI application that they can apply some of these techniques to that. What's that going to look like? What's the framework you're using for the GUI and what are the kinds of things you're thinking of including? 
So when I originally started the book, I was using WX Python because I'm really familiar with it and have been using it for over a decade. Yeah. After launching the Kickstarter, I had a couple of people mention, hey, you could shorten these examples and make them more readable if you used PySimple GUI instead. Okay. And I was like, that's a really neat idea. I tried it out, and the example code you end up with is about 50% less than the WX Python equivalent. And since you're not using uh, object-oriented programming with PySimple GUI, it is easier to explain what's going on to some degree. So I went ahead and switched to that. And I, I kind of like it so far. So back to your question of how I'm going to do it with what I'm going to show the user or the reader, I mean. Each chapter will have a GUI that lets them use, lets them apply something or that they learned in the chapter. So like the image filter chapter, you'll get to create a GUI that can apply any of the filters that you used in the chapter to an image and you can see how it, how it applies in real time, so to speak, in your GUI. Nice. And you had written an article about PySymbol GUI, is that right? Yes, I've, I've written one on For Real Python, and before that, I even had one on my own blog. Yeah. So we, I'll link to those, and people can learn a little bit more there. That's kind of nice that it helps to even abstract the GUI even a little bit more, which is uh, it's great that it's going to save you code for something like a book. Cutting out a lot of that boilerplate is going to be great. Yeah, I mean, I the, the cool thing about... WX Python is it has Pillow built in, so you don't even have to import Pillow. Oh, it just does it magically underneath. Whereas you have to use it in Python GUI, but that's okay because the code's shorter and easier to understand. So there's those trade-offs. Yeah. Are there other ways that you're using Pillow or have been using Pillow in the past? I have used Pillow a little bit for like lo- like checking for colors in an image. Like, again, this was with my testing background. We would test to see, you know, does the does the map that I'm loading have a certain color on it that's not supposed to be there, like an error condition, you know, because when it's an error, we have a different color. And so if that color is in the screenshot, then we know something bad happened, so to speak. So you can you can get all the colors that are in an image and then search for those RGB values in the list. So that, that again, is in a, in a testing situation yes. where it can alert you across a, a variety of machines that there's a, an error on one of those machines yes. uh, without you having to like visually go and <laughs> look through every one of them. That's cool. Yeah. So, but I could totally see myself. So I, I, I used to take a lot of photos and that's kind of my, my hobby when I'm not programming or writing. And I could totally see myself using pillow to do like a batch process after I do some photos outside where I need to like add a watermark so that people know it's my image or, I could use it to crop them all a certain way or, you know, enhance them, you know, brighten them up a little bit, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think of that, you know, having dabbled in a variety of web frameworks, uh, things like Django and Flask, I think that's the most common place that I've seen Pillow kind of being used is Mm -hmm. inside of some CMS sort of system in the background helping you gather the images or even just simply be able to in, bring them in <laughs> and open them and yeah. and kind of uh, do really simple, like just, okay, you know, I need to be able to open up these objects and so forth. But yeah, I mean, that's such a common thing for, for ph- photographers or people that work in, in web situations where they want an automated system to make sure all these images are resized and potentially cropped to something that makes sense. And then things with so many image formats are uh, compressed Mm -hmm. to be able to choose like a level of compression. Is that something you can do in there? We didn't get, I was going to come back to this, right? Of like the formats, like what are the file formats that can do? And then maybe we could talk about compression in that too. So yeah, it's, it works with all the standard formats, TIFF, JPEG, PNG, GIF, or GIF. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I'm trying to, and it, it allows you to convert between the two, between any of them, as far as I can tell. Yeah, okay. I didn't check to see how it works with compression, though. That's, that is a good question. That's something that we can find out more about. In, in the case of something like a PNG, mm-hmm. it that allows you to have uh, alpha channel, you know, where it can, you can have transparency. Yeah. Uh, does it, it supports that still, too? I believe so, yes. And the, and I recently learned you can do animated PNGs and animated uh, GIFs as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's cool. 
you could do something to stack them together then like uh, take several images and Mm -hmm. glue them together possibly okay all right cool wow it's pretty elaborate uh library yeah (laughs) when i started the book i was like does this thing do everything that I think it does? And it does more, a lot more than I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> I guess maybe that might lead us to thinking about like, okay, well, what is this not good at? Like what is pillow? You know, what, what's not the focus of, of this library? So from what I have learned, just looking into this is that pillow is not good for pixel by pixel manipulation. So if you need to, go through all the pixels in a in a large image file, you'd probably be better off using NumPy or Pandas okay. or, or even OpenCV for that sort of thing. Okay. And a tool like OpenCV, uh, CV standing for computer vision, is that right? Yes, that's correct. How is that different? And in, in comparatively, is it more of an analysis thing versus a manipulation sort of thing? Yeah, so like OpenCV is more for teaching your computer how to see something. So you can, you know, you can recognize faces with OpenCV. You can recognize objects. And this actually kind of bleeds up into Pillow. You could determine, you know, how much blue is on a, on a, in a picture versus black. And I think you could do that with Pillow, but you'd probably be faster code-wise and probably be better to write it in OpenCV versus Pillow. Okay. Do you have machine learning on the background to kind of help you out with that? So the idea of, all these kind of other additional recognition sorts of things that are being used, um, security or or otherwise, is more in that realm of OpenCV. Yeah, but so Pillow is for you know doing image image manipulation itself, whereas a lot of these other libraries like NumPy, Pandas, they're for number crunching mostly, but you can also use them for machine learning. And Pillow really isn't for machine learning, except possibly as like a dependency to like open the images for the other libraries. Because I know you can mix Pillow with NumPy or Pandas and kind of pass the objects back and forth between the two. Yeah. One of the things that we kind of talked a little bit about is the idea of doing this cropping and adjusting you know, potentially the file sizes and or converting all to one format. Mm-hmm. Is this uh, a good framework for doing like overall batch processing? Yes, I think it'll work quite well for that. Um, again, as long as you're not trying to do something that where you where you want to like change a whole bunch of pixels all at once, you'll be fine. It, it should work just fine. From what I've read, it it supports using Python studying library for most of its operations, so you should be able to even do stuff in parallel. Which library? Sorry, it, Pillow is th- is as far as I can tell, mostly thread safe. So you should be able to use it in parallel. Okay, good. That way. Is that something you're going to dive into a little bit with uh, batch processing? Yeah, I do plan to have a chapter that talks about batch processing and how you could accomplish that using the Pillow library. Yeah. And then you, as you're probably doing the writing, you sometimes will break out some of your ideas out on the blog, um, which is your mouse versus Python blog. And you put up a... one about EXIF data. And so that's something I'm very interested in because I guess if maybe if you could just give people a heads up of like, okay, what is EXIF data that's stored within an image? So um, all images that you take with a camera anyway come with the exchangeable image file format or EXIF. And it usually will contain information about the camera itself and what settings you use, like the aperture, the shutter speed, the make and model of the camera. Yeah. And that kind of thing. Okay. That article that I wrote is about GPS tagging. And, you know, most most phone cameras have the ability to add GPS tags when you take a photo. I think it's off by default. At least it was on my Samsung phone. But some phones, you know, you can turn it on or it's on by default. And when you take it, it adds a GPS info tag to the XF data. And then Pillow lets you extract that data. So then you could use the, the GPS coordinates that you have and you know potentially write some code that would show where you took your photos on Google Maps or something. Drop them all as they're as they're added. I know that I have an iPhone and I think by default it may be on actually. So it might be different different defaults for different uh, camera manufacturers. Mm-hmm. And I remember this idea of kind of wanting to do the reverse of what you're talking about. I had a, 
well, I still do. I have uh, a couple, you know, regular DSLR sort of cameras that are not mm -hmm. brand, brand new, and they don't have like a GPS system in them. I, I know there are some cards that actually feature <laughs> like adding GPS and like the, the storage card itself adds that as it goes, which is pretty kind of surprising. Mm. So what I have very often is a library of 10 year old photos or something like that it might be from one of these standalone DSLR cameras. And I was thinking, would this be a, a good way if I wanted to batch process again, like add, I knew these were all taken at this party, or I knew all of these were taken, you know, at a particular amusement park or something like that, that I could actually stuff the GPS XF data inside. Um, I think, I'm not sure, but I don't think Pillow actually lets you change the XF data. Let me check really quick. It lets you read it, but not necessarily write it. Oh, well, no. Can you? I think you have to use a different library for that. Okay. All right. We might have to look at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure. I've, I've just, seen tools that do that, but... It's for loading it. Yeah, there are there are other Python libraries for actually editing the XF data. Okay. So this was mainly just to be able to get it and pull it out. Correct. Um, which is still useful. Yeah. One of the things that I've thought about is I have this huge library of photos, and I would like it to sometimes just go through that library and show me all the pictures that were shot with this Nikon camera versus a Canon camera versus a particular iPhone. Mm -hmm. And I think it even lets you, you know, like some of the new phones, like probably your Samsung even probably has multiple lenses. I mean, there's like the mm -hmm. front camera, the back yeah. camera, like a wide camera. So all those could be uh, targeted through XF data and allow you to maybe sort your information and in your, your photo library. Yeah, you could you could easily dump all that data into a SQLite database and then then filter it however you want after that. Nice. So you talked about watermarking. What form does that take? Would you have to have another like small image that you would use to put a watermark into uh, an image? You can do that with, with Pillow. You can watermark by using the paste command to paste one image on top of another. Or you can use image draw, which is a separate module in Pillow. And then you just draw text Onto your onto your images wherever you want the text to show up, and you can change the font. Is that a similar part of the library as the other thing we were talking about of like um, adding lines or squares or things to an image? Yes, yeah. So our image draws also supports drawing text as well as shapes and lines and whatnot. Okay, so some of the projects that you're creating throughout the book, you said there'd be sort of one per chapter. Mm -hmm. So like initially you would. I think the first one would be something like, you know, just creating something where you you can actually just look at images. Is that right? Yeah. So like the first chapter, you write something that'll display images on your computer, you know, one at a time. And then you kind of build on that in later chapters, because now instead of just viewing them, you can apply the filter or the enhancement, or you can crop it. Well, I didn't do cropping. I did rotating. But, you know, you, you can do other things. Well, that's a common problem <laughs> um, of rotated ones. Yeah. Later chapters will have things like diving into the filters of uh, adjusting with, you know, contrast and brightness and sharpening. Mm -hmm. And so the tool will kind of grow to have these additional features. I, I think at the end, I'm going to combine all of the features and try to create like a, a more, maybe a single app or maybe a, two smaller apps just so that they have all the features combined. Because I, I'm just trying, right now, I'm just trying to keep each chapter having a small GUI example instead of yeah. constantly expanding it. But at the end, I think I'm going to kind of like put it all together and talk about this is how, you, how you'd make it work so it can do all of these things. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It covers a topic we touch on during this week's episode about how to wrangle Microsoft Excel files using Python. Is titled Editing Excel Spreadsheets in Python with OpenPy Excel. The course is based on a real Python article by Pedro Pregriro. In the course, instructor Joe Tatusco takes you through how to read Excel spreadsheets and iterate through the data, manipulate spreadsheet data using Python data structures, create simple and more complex spreadsheets, format workbooks using styles, filters, and conditional formatting, enhancing spreadsheets by adding images and charts. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how to use Python to manage and automate processes with these extremely common spreadsheet files and workbooks. I think it could save you and your office tons of time and frustration. 
And like most of the video courses on RailPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, and you get code examples for the techniques shown. And as one of the newest courses on the site, it already has transcripts with closed captions ready to go. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. When you're coming up with these ideas and kind of working through them, are you someone who uses something like Jupyter Notebooks where you can kind of try things out multiple times? Or is would this library work well in that sort of experimental library where you can kind of like have cells where you're like, okay, I want to try this and then I want to try it again and run it again? Or do you, do you use a different way of kind of iterating through your examples? So when it comes to writing, I write the code for the, the pillow examples first. And to make sure that those work the way I want them to, because that's the whole point of the book is to explain how Pillow works. And then once I've got those working, I, I write them in such a way that I can import them into my GUI. So then the GUI can just call the, the code that you learned earlier in the chapter. Oh, okay. So it's sort of modular that way, which is good. Yeah. I try to keep it all modular so that it's easy to understand and you get to reuse the code that you already wrote. And so, you know, I already know my code works. And now I just need to add a GUI to the front end of it. Nice. As you're going through this process, what's, you know, I know you mentioned that you were surprised by all the additional things that it could do. Are there other things that have surprised you about the library? Uh, the, mo- the main thing I was surprised about was when I was looking at the image ops and I saw it did colorization of grayscale. I was like, I thought that was something that you could only do in more advanced libraries. So, you know, I'm just finding like little surprising things here and there that I'm like, this is really cool. So, so you could do things like change a- an overall image and do things like like sepia tones or or other kinds of colorizations? I'm not entirely sure what all it does, but I think it'll take a grayscale image, like an old photo that's from the 1920s, and make it try to make it look the colors it should be. Okay. Wow. Cool. That's my that's my understanding. I haven't experimented with my own photos yet to see exactly how it all works. Nice. Are there other things that now that you're playing with it a little bit more? that you are looking forward to using in your own uh, processes or for your own photos? Are there things that you're like, oh, this is going to be great. I could use this now for this new purpose. Well, I, I really liked how easy it was to put two photos side by side. Oh, okay. And if I could use that and then then draw, you know, do the image draw thing, where I could say this was taken in 1990 versus, you know, 2020, then I could kind of do the... Yeah. Do the Facebook thing where people like to, you know, show, hey, this is a baby photo and here, here's how so-and-so has grown or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. You could actually do in Python, <laughs> you know, it'd be kind of cool. That's such a, a, I mean, it's not a directly, but there's like a meme going now, like how, when, how it started <laughs> mm-hmm. and how it's going or something like that, I think is the, the meme. But yeah, I could see that. that that's cool. I, I thought of, there's a few libraries that that try, or I guess they would be apps like on the iPhone or what have you, um, that let you try to combine things like that. Like, uh, I think one mm-hmm. creates what are called triptychs where it would like have three images together or you're combining them across like different sort of geometric boundaries. Like, okay, we'll take these two and we'll make them be sort of square. And then the bottom one will be rectangle or whatever, and to kind of create an overall image out of three photos. Mm, um, yeah. So that not, sounds like maybe something you could do then with with the library potentially. Yeah, I think with a little bit of planning, you could make it make it do something like that. Okay. How long do you think the process will be for you to get this book into <laughs> into people's hands? So what I normally do when I run a Kickstarter is I have about fifty percent or more of the book done, and after the Kickstarter is over, I'm hoping to have eighty to ninety percent of it done. Okay. And I I will release that version of the book as an ebook so people can check it out early. And then I will on my target date for full publication, paperback and all that good stuff is in April of 2021. So I've got about three more months. When we talked last time, we talked a little bit about the artwork and trying to find um artists for creating the covers. Is uh is this a new artist this time or is it somebody you've used before? Um I haven't used this artist before, no. I actually ended up trying out Fiverr because I was curious to see if I could get a good art from Fiverr. And this artist was pretty good. I, I like his art overall. I didn't really save a whole lot of money on it. So, you know, I can't say you're going to make it. I don't know that that was a good trade-off or not from one of my established artists. But I like to give 
most of my books kind of a unique cover. So it's always fun to experiment and see what you end up with. Yeah. Did we hit most of the things you wanted to talk about, uh, about the book? Um, let's see. You didn't mention the Jupiter notebook part. Yeah. You know, is it possible that you'd, I mean, I'm trying to think about how you would use it in some side of something like a Jupiter notebook. I know that you can have like a cell that's a graph, but I would think that you could potentially use something like that where you kind of interactively are running the code and changing parameters inside of it. Do you think that would work well or have you tried it? I actually tried it because I was curious. Okay. So <laughs> um, in Jupyter Notebook, uh, in Pillow, there's a show method which will display your your image to the user using the native image viewer, basically, on whatever OS Pillow is running on. Well, if you call dot .show in a Jupyter Notebook, Jupyter will render it on the page. You could actually write interactive code in a Jupyter Notebook and it will work. The only caveat... I noticed is that it's kind of slow. And I don't know if this is Pillow or Jupiter that's being slow here. Hmm. So I wouldn't recommend using like full full high res images because uh, it's also not going to like resize the image correctly either, most likely. So you're going to want to like use lower res photos so that they can actually be shown quickly and so they don't like blow out of blow off the screen basically. <laughs> it doesn't try to stuff it inside the cell per se. It it I don't think so. To... I think it. I think it just tried to load it in full res, and oh, okay. I think that's why. I think that's part of the reason it was slow, is it wasn't creating a thumbnail and being smart about it. Okay, so it might be a little clunky, <laughs> depending on. I mean, if you have images that are uh, a good size for working inside of the web browser environment that is Jupyter Notebooks, <laughs> so many images are so huge now. And I, I didn't. I don't think I asked about that. Mm-hmm. Are there limitations to image size? or, you know, the number of megabits or megapixels that the thing can can be in? Um, when I looked that up, the, the main limitation is that it, it stops at, like, 2 gigs is the biggest size it can handle. Oh, okay. Which is still big enough that it'll handle pretty much anything except people who have the mega cameras that are taking pictures of, like, outer space or something. Yeah, okay. I guess kind of, I don't know, not entirely related. Is there... Anything that's similar like this in in video that you you are aware of? I know it's not the topic, but um, not for editing, no. Okay, I know you can. I know you can do some real time stuff with uh, OpenCV where you can analyze the the frames in a video. Yeah, that makes sense for different things. But okay, yeah, and that that makes sense because that's kind of more the idea of that. And I would think in a lot of OpenCV circumstances, those are really capturing more of a stream of images as opposed to individual Mm -hmm. (laughs) images um, per se. Okay. Yeah. So it's a little more uh, working across a set of frames instead of just a single one. Yeah, correct. Nice. We mentioned before on our previous conversation that you have a book about Python interviews. Can you tell me a little more about that? I just kind of like remind some people and then I was wondering if we could talk about some of the recent interviews you've done on your site. Yeah, sure. So Pact Publishing approached me to write a book for them called Python Interviews. And basically, it was going to be a collection of interviews from people in the Python world. That And so that's that's what I did. I interviewed, I think it was 20 people for that book. Yeah. I contacted a lot more than 20. And it was really fun to just talk to different people that are movers and shakers in Python. And Learn, learn what they liked about Python, see see what they had to say about Python's future, stuff like that. And then you've kind of continued the series with your Dev of the Week, which is um, a pretty regular, I mean, that's it's like a weekly series, right, on your site? Yeah, correct. That, that's actually where I packed and first approached me, is that I have a PyDev of the Week series that's been running, uh, I think it's been five years, something like that. Wow. Okay. And... I've only missed a couple of weeks, I think. I was going to ask but, you. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but anyway, yeah, so the uh, last few weeks I've had um, some people, I don't even know exactly how to say their names, but I, I've had a lot of fun meeting all these different people. Yeah. Reuven Lerner was really fun. He's a, I think he was actually on the Real Python podcast recently. Yeah, he was on recently, yeah. He, he used a, a lot of fun to talk to. He, he has some very interesting teaching techniques that we kind of dove pretty deep into it was a fun conversation yeah nice yeah yeah i've talked talked to people who are consultants in python and authors as i kind of run the full gamut when it comes to pydev of the week 
are there certain things that you're looking for for a particular dev? Like, is there certain interests that you follow that make you kind of go after different pr- people to uh, get an interview with them? Um, I usually look for people. I, I prefer like authors or people who speak at conferences because they usually have more to say than like a beginner would. Yeah. But occasionally a beginner will re- produce a really amazing uh, Python package and I'll feature them because the Python package is really cool and it's fun to see what their journey is like and show people that, you know, even a beginner can produce something awesome. Yeah, it's kind of shocking. <laughs> I've been kind of trying to follow a similar path with the podcast where I want to try to find people that have like a whole sort of topic to talk about. And, you know, books are obviously a great way into that, but also conference talks are a good way. Mm-hmm. Also, as opposed to, you know, just talking to somebody it's easier to kind of develop a sort of a theme and then kind of dive into sort of teaching some of the the details out of that. Are there techniques in the questions that you ask that that you think that helps get people to open up a little more about the topic? It's kind of more of a case by case basis. So the the Pi over the week series, and the first few questions are the same for everyone, and then I add a few extras that focus in on something that that the person I'm interviewing does. So like. Recently, I interviewed, uh, I think his name is Martin, and he's the creator of the LXML package for Python, which is super cool. And he created the MorePath web framework. So I asked him questions about those that are very specific that he would answer versus, you know, someone else that I, like like uh, Ruben that we were just talking about. I'd ask him, how'd you become a consultant? Yeah. Or how would I become a consultant if I wanted to be one? You know, that, that it's that kind of stuff where it's kind of a mix of, Begin a question that everyone has to answer, and then giving them more specific stuff so they can kind of talk about about what they're passionate about. Nice. So I have a couple of weekly questions that I like to ask. The first one is, what's something that you're excited about in the world of Python right now? Um, well, I'm excited that uh, PyCon is still going to happen, even if it's still only virtual. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping they have better. I don't know what I'd call it. Group events, kind of. I hope they have kind of a virtual open space because I like to talk to other Python people if I could. Have you checked out some events that are trying to do that? Not yet. Okay. I, I'm hoping to do that this year. We'll see how that goes. So the Pi Cascades people, th- th- their episode should be just before this one coming out. Uh, they are really experimenting with that. They are going to use some pre-recorded talks, but they're going to have the person live, if you will, present mm-hmm. and then play their their video and then have a bit of a Q&A thing after and then they are also going to do like in an interactive track and I'm really intrigued to see how this goes they say that they were working based upon a lot of the technology that the PyCon Australia people did and I'm not sure when that was so I'm intrigued to see what that was like but again in an interactive thing you'd have to be there to to really know what it was kind of like yeah I checked out one Gosh, I guess it would be the spring. It was called PyCon Pizza. Mm. They were very short talks. They were not pre-recorded. They were given live. And uh, Gare Arna was one of them, and Lucas was on there. And so it was like people I kind of I knew a little bit, and I'd watch it. But it was very European-centric, so the times were mm-hmm. really off for <laughs> the U.S. It was like, all right, wake up at 4 a.m. And, <laughs> and try to check this stuff out. So that was kind of interesting. But they had a Discord area to kind of do prep and so forth. And then they would break out the, the speaker into like a room, and people would chat. But I think having something where there's also not necessarily Zoom, but some other kind of component like that, where there's a, a you know sort of a way to, to have video kind of back and forth or ask people live questions and yeah, I don't know. It sounds like a lot of fun, and it's a pretty inexpensive conference. It's like twenty dollars, and so hmm. I'm excited to check that one out. And then yeah, I I hope that <laughs> we have all these amazing developers and all this amazing technology. So it, it you know, mm-hmm. if we're not scrambling to try to just pull something together, having a little bit more chance to plan something uh, for a conference, I think yeah. it should be kind of neat to see what kind of hallway interactive <laughs> track they can build. Cause I want to talk to people too. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Maybe I'll check that out. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. And then the next one is, well, I mean, obviously you're deep into learning about 
Hello, but what, what's something else that you're interested in, in learning next? Yeah, so I actually have two things. I've only recently started using Python with GUI. I'd like to learn more about it. Yeah. But uh, mainly because I'm just, I just want to see what I can do to replace my current stuff if I want to replace it. But the other one I'm interested in is Open OpenPy Excel, which is for working with Excel documents. Yeah. I used to do that all the time. And I think it'd be fun to just learn more about it and see what all it can do. Yeah, that's a neat library. And Excel is kind of bananas, like how deep you can go into it. <laughs> I, I think I yeah. mentioned uh, before the show or whatever, my wife is sort of, and we joke that she's sort of the Excel queen and she has done really amazing stuff. I mean, obviously there's, you know, charts and graphs and stuff and she works in mortgages and banking and, mm -hmm. you know, pivot tables and all these kind of other kinds of interactive things. But she created like an entire like cookbook <laughs> inside of there, like and and then printed from mm. there. And I was like, wow, that seems like the weirdest <laughs> <laughs> use that I'd heard of of like you know, you know taking something that should normally be like in like a page layout program or, or even just something like a text editor. But that was you know that's the tool that she knew and was comfortable with. And as far as like laying out all these recipes and stuff, I was like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of, it's surprising the things that you can do inside of there. And yeah, yeah. So that's cool. I'm, I'm, we have of course about open XL, which I think is really good. And then mm -hmm. interested to see what else you come up with from there. That'd be great. Yeah. I'm looking forward to checking it out soon. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show again, Mike. Oh, I appreciate it. It's always good to, good to talk to other Python people and share what I'm up to. Yeah. Well, great. Well, good luck with the book. I look forward to checking out when it's done. Thanks. I hope you like it. All right. Bye. Don't forget, start your 14-day trial today with Scout APM. And as an added bonus for Real Python listeners, Scout APM will donate $5 to the open source project of your choice when you deploy. I want to thank Mike Driscoll for coming on the show again. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.